Hello, I'm Nathaniel Osgood from the Computational Epidemiology and Public Health Informatics Lab at the University of Saskatchewan. And I'm going to be talking today about cross-leveraging data science and system science to help us understand the impact of highly trained service dogs uh, on veterans suffering from opioid challenges uh, who also suffer from post-traumatic stress disorder. Now, while today I'm going to be focusing on a particular vignette, the broader context of this is, is really a metaphor, and it's a metaphor uh, for um, a challenge which extends across a wide variety of, of uh, intervention, um, intervention spheres in the health area and in cognate areas. And that concerns the fact that we're often interested in moving beyond rather coarse-grained understanding the effects of an intervention, where you know, we, we observed an intervention and we measured um, uh, perhaps over um, uh, occasional measurements over a long period of time, um, or just a few very coarse grain measurements at the end, um, outcomes with respect to a couple uh, outcome indicators. But um, we may have a, a disappointing result, nor exciting result, but we we've, um, have limited understanding of exactly why we secured that result. For many interventions, complex interventions, or other interventions that are not themselves complex, but they intervene on a complex system, often there are many pathways to effect um, by which a given outcome is achieved. And with traditional tools, often we, we um, uh, lack uh, the ability to really resolve uh, the, the pathways by which intervention effects are felt. And therefore, particularly if the intervention wasn't as successful as hoped, we're often left somewhat flat-footed in terms of, of deriving better intervention strategies. And even where the intervention was successful, to ensure we put in place, as, as my colleague Jeff McDonald says, fixes that stay fixed, um, we're often um, left in a difficult situation because uh, we're not sure to what degree the results we sec have secured are contingent on particular aspects of the situation. Now, today's vignette that we're going to be looking at um, focuses, indeed, as I noted earlier, the impact of, of highly trained service dogs, uh, service dogs trained by our, our partner, Automus, um, which maintains a really rigorous, um, uh, very well codified and very um, uh, extensively uh, followed uh, methodology for training service dogs um, uh, to deliver uh, care, uh, companionship, yes, but also a wide variety of other benefits um, for, um, uh, for veterans and others um, uh, who, who uh, seek, um, uh, seek their, their care. The partners in this work uh, include, as um, co-principal investigator Colleen Dell, um, a, a chair in addictions at University of Saskatchewan, uh, but it includes a wide variety of other partners as well. Um, and um, what we're going to see in, in this presentation is, is really uh, beginning work. It's, it's work that um, relates to a modified case crossover trial um, uh, of just over uh, three quarters of a year in duration. Uh, with a very small end. We're, we're anticipating and um, um, hoping very much uh, uh, that those anticipations are met for a, a rapid expansion to about uh, 30 veterans, but we are talking about a fairly small number of individuals right now. But the general um, program we're talking about could be scaled up to a considerably larger number. We're talking about a, a control study in, in the sense that um, not only do we have a, a crossover uh, situation where um, at first, the veterans do not have a, a highly trained service dog, and, and later come to uh, um, come to be paired with uh, with one through training. Um, but we're also talking about six controls with with companion animals. And in this work, we're going to be leveraging um, a wide variety of tools from from system science and data science, including a larger scale data collection that includes. Um, uh, measurements from um, the veterans themselves through um, smartphone-based sensors and, and wearables, um, Fitbits, um, but as well um, uh, Internet of Things devices worn by, by the dog. Um, and we're interested in looking at the dog's impact on a wide variety of, of outcome indicators, um, including flash, uh, flashbacks, but also uh, substance use um, and, and social contact, etc. 
Some of the motivating research questions um, here, only some of which I'll, I'll, I'll address, are um, you know what are the impacts of these uh, these service dogs on the well-being with with of veterans who who suffer from these um, these twin challenges of post-traumatic stress disorder and, and opioid use um, at the level of of uh, dependence. Second of all, and and a very uh, key point. What are the generative pathways by which these effects are realized? Um, if we think about introducing a veteran to a, a service dog, um, and we think about uh, various outcome indicators of interest, senses of well-being, um, substance use, say in the form of, of opioid use, sense of um, alienation, which risks uh, suicidal ideation. Um, one of the quandaries here, as in so many interventions, um, is the fact there's many particular pathways by which those are affected. And if all we observe is sort of crude indicators, um, as noted earlier, we'll often have, have little indication. To have an understanding of the richness of the different pathways here, we, we need to appreciate the fact that um, time engaging with a service dog affects many things. Um, one of the things that that affects that may be um, clear for many is, is that affects uh, a sense of companionship uh, from the dog uh, for a veteran who, who um, may keenly need that, which which uh, ripples through to an overall sense of companionship and a lowered sense of ideation and of alienation and 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 from that um, uh, factors related to uh, lower use of opioids, enhanced well-being, etc. Um, but there's other many other pathways as well. I mean, um, some of them are. Uh, um, may be um, obvious. I mean, the veteran assumes more responsibilities in life. There's a greater structure, perhaps, to a life that's hitherto been somewhat um, chaotic or less structured. And perhaps that, that enhances uh, sleep patterns, um, going to sleep at, at regular times, and lowers the chance of, of, of flashback occurrence as well as enhancing sense of well-being. Other, uh, so that's one hypothesis. Um, uh, for for some of these generative pathways, um, uh, to use the language of, of critical realism, um, uh, another another one might be the fact that the dog um, leads the veteran to uh, spend more time outside of the home um, through its physical needs. Uh, the veteran gets uh, uh, a greater amounts of physical activity, perhaps at a, at a moderate or even vigorous level but also lessens the sedentary behavior. And those ripple through to physical health, which can of course enhance sense of well-being as well as through really vigorous physical activity directly. Um, uh, another factor though is that the time outside of the home leads to often um, uh, greater levels of social contact with others. To a degree, the veteran can control. Having a dog at the end of the leash allows them to engage more closely with others or or be more distant as their needs um, and comfort levels suggest, which can, and that's social contact with not just um, uh, their dog, but with uh, other members of the community can lead to a sense of companionship and a lowered sense of, of uh, alienation. The time in, uh, spent outside of the home um, also assists you with time, uh, may drive uh, time with the service dog community. The, the dog, um, will bring them out into training sessions with other people who have dogs, other people often from similar background, which can enhance their social contacts, their pro-social companionship, which can lower their sense of, of alienation and ripple through ultimately uh, to well-being and, and sleep, et cetera. Um, so we're seeing um, many factors. Um, one, I wanna bring a, a particular attention to because it does have to do with PTSD so centrally, which is that uh, because of the the dogs are are highly trained um, here, uh, the dogs are actually trained to interrupt um, um, uh, stress stress responses on the part of the veteran, it, it based uh, based on particular symptoms for a specific veteran. This could include crying out or moaning slightly, or it could include uh, agitated motion in terms of of of, of leg motion. Um, and the dog uh, is trying to interrupt in these, provide companionship as the appropriate type of dog suggests um, to lessen those stressors. And this extends to flashbacks that may occur as nightmares uh, during sleep. The dog is trained to, to intervene um, uh, in, in the night um, 
with veterans experiencing flashback in a way that can, can cut through the flashbacks, can help um, uh, prevent their physical symptoms from being most keenly felt, which can avoid them casting a shadow over subsequent days. So this issue of what are the degenerative pathways um, uh, by which the effects are felt are, are, it's a rich question here. And it's one that's very important if we want to improve the success of the intervention. If we want to get more of the things, get more bang for our buck, get more of the things that are going well, or if we want to understand which, which pathways are maybe working across purposes. For example, physical activity is, is increased, but the veteran court um, uh, also uh, leads to uh, countervailing sedentary behavior that might allow us to design a more judicious um, uh, regimen for the, uh, for the veterans, which lessens, uh, which enhances the outcomes. Um, and we're interested in understanding as a step towards that are the particular pathways whose differential effect being different across different veterans can help best explain the outcomes we measure across those veterans. So this teasing apart multiple pathways to effect is a key component here and it's a key component for, for I would argue, many interventions. Now, here we're going to be looking at um, uh, factors that, that help us understand a richer set of ways in which machine learning and, and data science can relate to theory. Sometimes um, machine learning and data science are, are held up as, as helping us move beyond theory. And the truth is that these techniques can help us identify and exploit salient empirical regularities that link observables. Um, there's a wide variety of techniques, including notably um, deep learning, that can help us do that. But what I'm hoping, uh, another message I'm hoping to drive across in this talk is that the relationship of machine learning to theory is much broader that, than that. It can help us explicate theory, it can help us inform and build theory, um, uh, pre-existing theory. Uh, and um, ultimately, I believe those, those contributions will grow larger as causal methods associated with, with deep learning rise. Because after all, both in terms of explaining the effects of an intervention um, uh, to others, um, uh, say to to those from health background, uh, health science background, um, but as well um, in, in order to reason about how this intervention would or would not continue to yield effects in a counter um, counterfactual situation, often we need to appeal to, to causal mechanisms, to theory. So we're going to be turning here to a set of techniques from data science that will help us build that theory, help us inform that theory, and ultimately help us explicate it um, by grounding our models. And uh, in a spectrum of data science techniques that we draw on, um, which verge from very coarse insights such as gathering data from counts associated with, uh, um, with, with Google searches, or monitoring Twitter for keyword counts or key phrase counts, sentiment analysis. Um, we're here at the far end of that spectrum where we're looking at mobile data collection where we have really finer insights um, and, it, and it's more flexible. And specifically, we're gonna be looking at, at leveraging smartphones as a central data collection platform. In particular, our, our generation three platform, um, uh, the Ethica uh, data platform, which is available for Android and iPhone and has a rich, rich web, um, web interface for both planning studies, for monitoring them as they're, they're ongoing and for seeing the results of studies um, once they're completed um, or, or uh, whilst, whilst they're underway, um, observing the incoming data, performing analytics on it. Um, uh, these studies run on, on participant smartphones as here. Um, uh, and uh, they make use of a, of a battery sipping mechanism that allows us to transmit data batched up on the phone. So the phone can go a long period of time without, without connections. And we're tapping here um, sensor modalities as well as um, crowd, uh, for many studies, crowdsource data. That's not a big component of this particular study, um, although it could be with buttons to indicate flashbacks. Um, 
but uh, we're also making strong use of, of the rich questionnaires permitted by Ethica. So the idea here is that, look, each study within Ethica can feature its own user interface with custom buttons and background, a, a sampling regimen that, that indicates for that particular study which, uh, which sensors should be monitored, um, and uh, finally, a set of uh, questionnaires, including rules for issuing them, sometimes triggered by things, in this case, say, presence of a dog, or separately, it could be absence of a dog for a certain period of time, for example. Here, we're focusing on the absence side. And um, all these mechanisms can evolve throughout the study without programming. Um, so uh, here, health scientists are empowered to, to quickly specify studies, um, uh, deploy them to phones, observe the results, uh, iterate by refinement, uh, et cetera. Um, so for this particular study, um, we're making use of a variety of, of components, um, some of which you see here. Uh, on the dogs, we have Bluetooth beacons mounted. Um, uh, and these allow the Ethica, the, the platform uh, that I just described, um, to sense the distance from the smartphone to the dog over time and to trigger questionnaires that take into account dog presence or absence. So um, uh, we're using in this study some uh, traditional instruments such as interviews of the veteran, the family, and, and, and trainer and, and uh, prescribing history data. Um, uh, in, in classic survey instruments such as the um, PDQ-9 for uh, scales of depression, et cetera. Um, but we're delivering many surveys via the, the smartphone. These are ecological momentary assessments. They come up during the day. They're micro surveys um, designed to just capture one question and perhaps some dependent questions. Um, and they allow uh, per, per Ethica's uh, standard operation, richer question types like those that allow submitting photos and audio or options of audio or text. Um, the phone is gonna measure a wide variety of things, but it also picks up Fitbit data that's gathered from the, um, the participant, um, which allows us to, to understand sleep and, and heart rate patterns in addition to the many sensors such as location and social contacts and so on that are measured um, uh, via Ethica on the, uh, the smartphone. So the study is simply configured for this particular study. We've chosen certain things to measure, as, as is done through the graphical interface on the, on the website. Um, and what we're measuring here um, is measured for very particular reasons having to do with, uh, for example, those causal pathways. For example, we measure the signal strength of the beacon uh, from the dog, from this little device, which can last up to years. We, we measure its, its signal strength, and that gives us some sense of proximity, uh, albeit of the, the smartphone, uh, to the dog, um, with the recognition that often the smartphone, not always, but often the smartphone can serve as a proxy for the veteran's location. And when it doesn't, through machine learning mechanisms I'll be alluding to later, we can, um, uh, we can recognize the data as um, as incomplete in that regard, and um, as as not being present with respect to the veterans' uh, location. It also measures uh, their uh, location via GPS and 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 and, and this assisted GPS, um, uh, taking into account some some Wi-Fi for most phones. And this can allow us um, to understand where they are. Um, and particularly time spent outside or inside. Um, we can understand through contact with the Bluetooth beacons from uh, other dogs and other studies. We can mark uh, people directly, but these give us a sense of interaction of the veteran, the index veteran, say, with veterans and other programs. And um, through GPS, I forgot to note, we can, we can sense the entropy, the mobility of a person, and the predictability of their movement patterns day to day and see how dogs affect it. Through accelerometry and heart rate, we can get a sense of physical activity and sedentary behavior. And through sleep length and regularity, sleep quality. And, and that can also contribute um, some to an understanding of flashback occurrence for which we can get additional insights through heart rate and, and certainly time and, and accelerometry. So uh, in addition to these automatically tracked um, sensors which don't require veteran um, uh, veteran uh, intervention through the device um, 
uh, we issue a variety of of, of other um, survey instruments that can pick up aspects of, of for example, PTSD symptoms, um, uh, substance use, um, uh, reason for separation from the dog when they've been um, measured as, as, as not having been um, measured nearby for a long time, human dog bond, etc. And through other instruments, other interviewing and traditional instruments, um, we can pick up aspects of more deeply of those um, depression and suicidal ideation and, and, and physical health. And these are through self-report. The resulting picture is an extremely rich one. Um, it can give us a sense over time of, of cross-linked events associated with the veteran's life. Um, so when the dog arrived uh, at, at the very beginning and, and um, presence of, of flashbacks after that, instances of poor quality sleep, uh, instances of social engagement, um, uh, cases of, of where they reported substance use, um, and, um, and, and this uh, can allow us to further recognize cases of moderate to vigorous physical activity, as well as time spent outside in sedentary behavior. So this gives us a picture over time at a fine-grained temporal level um, of the veteran's life, both before the dog is fully trained and after the dog is fully trained. Now, when it comes back to this, um, to this enterprise of seeking to understand pathways to effect, uh, this isn't a silver bullet, but it provides a very large amount of information. With traditional instruments, we can get, of course, some understanding of these pathways. We can understand, for example, self-reported aspects of, of physical health or opioid use or companionship uh, from the dog, um, senses of well-being. Um, but our, our knowledge about these is, it tends to be coarse um, for many reasons. Um, to, to, to lower burden, we don't ask these questions very often. And for things like sleep, we um, or physical activity or sedentary behavior, we don't have a physical measure. And often the reporting in these areas, as we know from, from past studies, can be um, quite inaccurate due to, uh, um, due to uh, recall bias, uh, sometimes due to confabulation and other factors. Um, uh, reporter bias. So, you know, here... Um, uh, you know, we, we need to be um, cautious about drawing too many conclusions from these very coarse-grained understanding, often very far spaced uh, apart. Um, given the system we've, we've set up here, you know, which gives us this picture, which, which leverages these different mechanisms and these different, um, uh, these different uh, sensor measurements, we can get a much finer picture along many different components, structure and life. We, pretty good proxy in terms of um, uh, predictability of behavior measured through things like um, mobility entropy. Um, or we could look at entropy extending to other factors as much of our work has contributed. Uh, we can look at, at uh, flashback as reported not by very coarse grained uh, reporting on a, you know, every 90 day basis, but, but with these micro surveys. We can look at physical activity or sedentary behavior through Fitbit. Um, which provides a very fine-grained understanding at the, at the level of, of literally seconds and minutes um, to provide a, a portrait of this person's life. Um, the amount of time they're spending with the dog, we don't have to depend on, on self-report. These, these things can be much better measured. And similarly with, with mixing um, with the service dog um, community. Um, with, with some techniques, we're very much hoping We'll be able to recognize um, uh, the occurrence of, of flashbacks quite reliably, although we have to do much more work to realize it. And the point is, not only can we measure things across, oh gosh, it's pretty much across all those um, different pathways talked about, we can measure these things in a, in a temporarily fine-grained way, in a way that's cross-linked. For a given time period, we can know what's going on across these different pathways when they're working at cross purposes. And we can look at how do those change compared to some of these outcomes, such as opioid use, senses of well-being, a self-reported sleep, if we want to view that as, as both a, a cause and symptom, um, suicidal ideation, etc.
So this capacity to distinguish these effects from multiple um, operating pathways can really serve as a very potent tool for, for explaining intervention outcomes, for reasoning through this tangled set of effects. And here we can use measurement at many points within the system to, to have some sense as to how big the changes are, you know, at this very starting point, just as things getting going, versus how do these same pathways change later in the game after the dog has been with the veteran for a long time. In the context of randomization, in the context of, of, of case crossover, um, we can examine which pathways are, are major drivers uh, for, for the outcome, are likely to be major, major drivers. Um, and the primary, we can start to hypothesize effectively, at least, about primary reasons for lack of intervention success. Um, uh, for example, where effects are being felt in the pathways, but, but the outcomes perhaps are too distal um, to, to have yet realized the effects. There's delays, uh, pronounced uh, delays. Um, so we can engage here in a variety of, of, um, uh, of, of different approaches that can help us make sense of this uh, very rich picture coming to us, this picture across many pathways, um, which leverages those different measuring uh, devices. And I'm going to be speaking here in, in coming slides, just in the very most brief of fashion, about some analytic approaches. Um, recognizing uh, that I have uh, separate lectures um, which talk about these different approaches um, in, in ways that will go into much more detail. Um, because I want to keep this, this talk short, um, I'm going to go light on, on details and, and refer you to other videos. Um, so one tool we make a lot of uses of, of dynamic modeling. Um, and specifically, we make use of, of agent-based modeling, this technique that distinguishes individuals and does so in a way that places them into context and can allow for interventions. Here, agent-based models represent uh, geography um, uh, in a way that, that you see here. They can also represent social networks uh, between individuals, both uh, static and, and more, um, more dynamic. Um, and they can allow us to, to reason, to hypothesize, to advance working hypotheses for underlying um, uh, drivers uh, for, um, for the, the, the factors that we see, the processes underlying the observed patterns. In short, about factors directly related to these uh, hypothesized causal pathways, these generative pathways. Um, but not only do models help us kind of nicely depict these things, they help us explicate, think through far more consistently than we could in our head, the implications of working hypotheses in terms of the patterns that they would imply, that they would yield. And they help us test the consistency of those patterns of, of positing certain structure within a certain context um, uh, and it tests the... the, the um, the consistencies of, of those against empirical data. So here we're not using dynamic models, agent-based models as, as some sort of crystal ball, which shatters when it's, it's off base, which, which provides no, no use when it, you know, it no longer predicts. But rather we're using these as, as in the words of my colleague, Jeff McDonald, learning prostheses. Tools that, despite our cognitive limitations, help us achieve functionality by, by helping us think through more quickly, more reliably, and more deeply um, our mental models to test the degree to which they're consistent with, uh, with observations, um, to test the degree to which they align with our expectations by running the models and, and seeing what they naturally apply, um, and, and allowing us to test very quickly mental models by, by testing whether they're consistent with what we know about the system, with the data. Um, against both uh, quantitative data and, and uh, qualitative data, um, uh, tacit knowledge that often a model will bring out that's otherwise not bring out. So these models help us evolve our mental model, help us um, uh, shape what data we collect, help us figure out what, what measurands do we need to pick up, for example, on our phones to, to better um, cross-check, to better um, 
to better test our hypotheses. So when a model fails, it's not a shattering of a crystal ball. Um, uh, that it's a, it's not a failure of the modeling. It's a, it's a success of learning. Um, it's a success of learning because here models um, take us out of a, a tight spot. They they uh, with traditional just thinking in our heads, we have a hard time going from our hypotheses, our, our positing, our, our working hypotheses about underlying health related processes to so understanding what dynamics they apply and not being able to do that when we rely only on formal reasoning, it's hard to test whether these hypotheses imply things that are consistent with empirical observations. But when we have a model, a model allows us to, to do this. It tells us what dynamics are implied uh, by our, our posited logic of the model. It tells us, okay, we would expect to see certain types of behavior over time extending from that. And by so doing, it lets us test the degree to which that those observations are consistent with, with our empirical data. By being able to run the model and seeing output here, seeing output at an individual level, uh, seeing output at a, um, a, a more global level, it allows us to test uh, the implications of our theories in the full light of day against empirical observations. Um, so, so this is how we're using models, not, not as some sort of perfect depiction of the situation, but to learn more quickly what, what underlying processes might give rise to the data we do pick up across these different causal pathways to test the consistency of our hypotheses with what we see and to know when we're, we're missing big pieces of the puzzle. Um, to, to more quickly falsify our, our thinking um, uh, by, by testing it uh, in the clear light of day. In other words, fail early, fail often, and fail forward. Um, uh, as Francis Bacon said in the 1600s, it is quicker to secure, one easy, more easily secures truth through error than by confusion. Um, positing that if we, if we put a stake in the ground, we try, um, try out a working hypothesis, test it out, we can more quickly observe when it's false and we learn from that. From that comes truth. Uh, more quickly than just settling back into confusion and, and shrugging our shoulders. So these models provide us with a way of, of testing our, our theories against this, this rich data, this rich data coming from multiple pathways. But a key supporting technology is one that we're making um, key use of in our, our work, which is convergent cross mapping. This technique provides us with ways to to test for the presence of causal connections between different factors in, in data. And it particularly benefits from larger amounts of data. Helps us assess whether there's causal impacts of one measured variable on another. And to, to, to delineate and, and to separate, to, to um, uh, distinguish ones that are unidirectional from A to B or from B to A or, or ones that are reciprocal. Um, it allows us to, to further get some sense about how the, strong the connection is, although uh, because it's, it's limited by noise and with a lot of noise, we can get a sense it's a weak connection. There are strong limits to this approach, but it provides us with some clues for these underlying causal pathways, some clues to what might need to be in the model to more, um, to more carefully um, capture the situation. But we're making use in this case with many other methods as well. Um, uh, for basic underlying classification of a veteran at a certain time, for example, are they inside or outside? So we can arrive at measures of, you know, inside or outside time, for example, um, to understand the proximity to the dog. Are they even next to the dog? How, how close are they? Um, are they, are they even carrying the phone right now? Is the phone's location a good proxy for the, for the veterans? Um, how much time are they spending with other veterans? When is a flashback occurring? Here we can make central use of machine learning um, approaches, and we do, um, uh, as in our other studies. And here 
We're seeking to leverage hidden Markov modeling, which we've had great success in for other studies for classifying things, as well as deep learning um, uh, through the TensorFlow uh, framework, recognizing um, um, reliable indicators through this um, and making use of, um, of, of ground truth uh, uh, for, for leveraging some of it, for example, time spent inside, outside. In other times, um, uh, we're, we're hoping to make higher level classification rather than just these lower level. Um, is it likely that opioid disorders has emerged for a veteran? Um, uh, recognizing early on failure, uh, early warning signs for failure to thrive that might provide a way to, to uh, enhance social support for that veteran or, or allow changes to their training regimen to, with the dog to, to head off a, a problem. Um, the, to recognize this, as we do with our work with uh, Alex Wong, uh, with um, with Ethica and modeling for opioid, or excuse me, for HIV um, sufferers, many of whom are opioid dependent, um, recognize the level of follow up that's required for a person. Um, uh, to what degree do they need to be seen very frequently or less frequently? Um, to what degree for HIV medication, are they good to go for six months at a time or nine months at a time, um, take their own meds, or to what degree do they need to be seen every day in the methadone clinic? These are the sort of things we can work to apply with, um, uh, with a variety of machine learning techniques. Deep learning to recognize these salient empirical uh, regularities, Bayesian graphical modeling and, and hidden Markov modeling for somewhat more theory-informed uh, methods that can still be very very effective at allowing us to, to infer underlying state and infer that early in a way that might be actionable. In other cases, um, we're seeking to predict. We're seeking to predict, um, for example, coming recurrence of opioid disorder um, so we can perhaps head it off, um, uh, provide that support, recognizing not when it's, 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 it's re-emerged already, but when it's coming, fly ahead of the plane. Um, hoping to, to be able to recognize uh, risk of short-term substance use to, again, perhaps um, down the road, be able to leverage um, call on social support for that veteran to, to help um, head off a, a lapse or, or head off a, a relapse more fully. Um, not just a slip up, but a relapse. Um, and to um, predict the degree of successful bonding with a particular dog in case, you know, a better match is, is needed. And here, Bayesian graphical modeling um, can, again, bring a more theory-based approach, but support vector machines and deep learning are, are, are techniques we're going to be using to, um, in this uh, prediction space. Now, one may be surprised to see me come back to dynamic modeling. Well, dynamic modeling is a versatile tool. It's a tool we use in so many of our studies in large part because it provides such, such um, strength, not only in, in a theory building and, and helping us to test theories, but in explicating theory. Once, that, once hypotheses are, are secured with greater confidence, once we have greater conviction in a working hypothesis, recognizing that it can still be undercut and, and we'll seek to undercut it with further data collection to test it with new interventions, et cetera. Um, once a hypothesis is secured, we can use it to explicate the implications for, for counterfactual situations. We use it to, to, to tentatively pause it. Okay, you know, what would the implications be if we put in place this alternative um, uh, training regimen for, for, for more um, um, veterans that, that have a tougher time with opioid uh, dependents or tougher time with their with getting their dogs to um, uh, to intervene with their flashbacks. And, you know, a key type of counterfactual intervention is is interventions. Um, it's not the only one. We may be interested in how well this program, you know, um, holds up. For example, in the event of unemployment on the part of of some of these individuals, um, or in the in the context of cannabis legal, legalization here in Canada which can impact um, um, enhance ability to, to lessen withdrawal symptoms, um, uh, can, can help uh, provide another regimen for uh, managing chronic pain, um, but also is, is fit into a, 
a complicated milieu of, of, of drug, um, uh, drug use. Um, so here, uh, uh, you know, we're, we're often interested in understanding counterfactuals. And here, we're making use of dynamic models as a way for reasoning not only about our working hypothesis about underlying health-related processes, but we're interested in layering on that. If we put in place this intervention, um, put in place policy regimes or particular um, individual level intervention or what have you, um, models can help us put those two together to, to help us understand the implied dynamics. Even for portfolios of policies, they can help us explicate what well, what's the implication of these portfolios? To what degree are they synergistic? To what degree do they work across purposes? Um, so based on this working hypothesis as captured in a model, um, to what degree do different interventions help us secure desired outcomes? Of course, we want to, on an ongoing basis, want to fail, fail forward, um, you know, uh, fail early, fail often by testing the model against the observations from the desired outcomes. But models can help us re reason these things through. And if we're depending on only informal reasoning, this is a devil of a time because we have trouble going just from this, from theorizing about the uh, positing underlying structure to, to what the implications are, much less layering it with interventions. But models, uh, ladies and gentlemen, models can help with that because models help us map here to the implied dynamics and they can therefore allow us to test to what degree are those implied dynamics consistent with the desired outcomes. So with a change, we can look at, okay, what's the implication um, uh, between these, uh, these two times, for example. So this has been a whirlwind tour of, a, um, of an important, rich vignette. Um, uh, a rich vignette in which we, we seek to to better understand pathways to effect by leveraging tools of system and data science, cross leveraging so one enhances the other. System science, uh, data science enhances system science by informing our models, by, by uh, allowing us to test um, the degree to which certain pathways may be operating in the world, by, by allowing us to pin down empirically what's going on along those pathways to better pin down what what needs to be captured in a responsive model, a reliable model. System science informs data science by informing us what things do we need to collect, shaping interventions to examine. Because the models often mirror these, these pathways we see um, on which we're measuring things. The models depict this fine-grained temporal, uh, fine, fine temporally grained uh, evolution of these pathways, just like the information we pick up via via the, the big data. So computational approaches here, far from being you know, counterposed to, in tension with um, theory building, they, they help here in theory building, theory explication, as well as by, yes, capturing patterns that lack current theoretical foundation, these, these um, uh, salient empirical regularities. A key use of, of data collected via um, via big data mechanisms, such as examined here with wearables and smartphones. Um, uh, in, in my view, is to couple them with these analytics to learn more deeply from interventions and to design new, new generations of interventions based on that, based on reasoning from models about how we could do better in ways that models capture the, uh, the, the insights from this intervention. And new generations of analysis methods here offer much potential for understanding how to intervene more judiciously. And really, given the fact that we increasingly not only cast a digital shadow, a shadow that can allow us to, with, with really low burden, pick up all sorts of valuable information for health insight, uh, having gone through con rigorous consent processes, um, uh, provide that insight to allow us to to better assist ultimately our struggles in life. Given that we not only have a relationship of casting these shadows, but those shadows affect us. Our our lives are increasingly shaped by by these digital shadows. You know the the um, workout shared on Fitbit Social or or uh, on Endomondo. The um, 
the chatter about uh, vaccination hesitancy on Twitter, um, uh, the uh, the growing concerns you hear on other forms of social media uh, with respect to a um, a, a pandemic of, of uh, influenza. Uh, these things shape our, our risk perception. They shape our knowledge, attitudes, beliefs about, uh, about health. And uh, as such, they need to be monitored. It's not merely a luxury. It's a, in, in many cases, it's really something we need to do. And these analysis methods provide the requisite strength, the requisite firepower to do exactly that dynamic modeling, data science techniques, such as deep learning, hidden Markov modeling, Bayesian graphical models, support vector machines. These are all key tools in our, in our um, evolving toolbox to help us learn more quickly from, um, from observations about the world, help us learn more deeply and reliably from those observations and, and um, from our interventions so that we can evolve towards ever more efficacious, cost-effective interventions. Thanks so much uh, for your attention. It's been my great pleasure to uh, be able to uh, convey with you some of the uh, salient points and excitement we have about this work. Stay tuned as the work progresses uh, over the next year. Thanks so much for the honor of your presence.